The Only Warrior Cats podcast strives to be family-friendly, but we may cover themes not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. There's a, there, oh no, there's a, the uh, furries. <laughs> oh no, what did you find? Not the right trading cards. Oh That's no, for sure. no, 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 they're so ugly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, why would you show me this? I'm sorry. Is this recording? It is. <laughs> okay. Hello, and welcome to the Only Warrior Cats podcast. We are the only Warrior Cats podcast, and this is the show where two Warrior Cats veterans read through each of the books with their new-to-the-series friend and help initiate him into the world of the Warrior Cats. I am Zoe B, and I am joined by my two absolutely wonderful co-hosts, Jose and Lola Sebastian. Say hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Today, we are going to be discussing the fifth book in the series, A Dangerous Path. Ooh, so spooky. Uh, so, Jose, would you like to kick it off with a summary of this most dangerous book? So we open with dogs loose in the forest. <laughs> they're out there. They're dangerous. They're causing all kinds of havoc. Or little do the cats of the forest know that they're all in horrible danger. Back uh, with ThunderClan, Tigerstar manages to find out that there are some ThunderClan cats in RiverClan, and he's uh, starting to suss out some of the secret plots that are going on behind the scenes. While he's finding that out, Greypool dies, and uh, she's not the first death. It's a lot of deaths in this one, because uh, shortly after, sadly, Snow Kit is uh, eaten by a hawk. Um, he, he was a deaf cat and uh, didn't hear him coming, and... Just gonna say this right now. Let's let's not uh, get all anti-bird in this in this episode. I'm just putting that up there from the top. Anyway, at Four Trees, Blue Star, who is acting increasingly erratic, nearly starts a war with Wind Clan when she accuses them of stealing prey. But luckily, Fireheart goes rogue, speaks to Tall Star, the Wind Clan leader, and manages to avert disaster. But that still doesn't keep Thunder Clan from mixing it up with River Clan over the as they fight over the Sunning Rocks. In the skirmish, though. Blue Star's kits, who are uh, living with River Clan, that's Misty Foot and Stone Fur, find out they're her kits. And when it looks like Fireheart's about to get got by Leopard Star, Gray Stripe rushes in, betrays River Clan, goes back to Thunder Clan. The boys are back together. Uh, and sadly, Gray Stripe is separated from his kits. Back at Thunder Clan's nest, the only apprentice that gets approved to becoming a full warrior is Cloud Pop, because Blue Star is impressed by his lack of faith, and he becomes Cloud Tail. The other apprentices, Swiftpaw and Brightpaw specifically, felt like they need to prove themselves. So they go out into the, the forest hunting down the threat that everyone knows is out there, but is not sure what it is. Uh, it's the dogs. Uh, sadly, though, when they come across the dogs, Swiftpaw gets killed and Brightpaw is maimed. Blue Star decides to be really mean and names her Lost Face, which was just horrible. So but luckily, it's not all bad news. Fireheart tells Sandstorm that he's in love with her. That's sweet. Uh, finally, by the way. And it looks like ThunderClan is once again in a state of crisis when the dogs are being led right to their den, thanks to the machinations of Tiger Star. But Fireheart knows it's coming, so he leads a very daring plot to save ThunderClan from these dogs. So to describe the plot, he basically leads the dogs away from the nest with the help of some other warriors. He's the last one there. He's going to take in the most dangerous part of the mission, and it looks like he's going to lead the dogs into the river. But then Tiger Star shows up. He starts fighting Fireheart. It looks like it's all going to go to shit and Fireheart might be out of luck again, but thankfully Blue Star, who seems to have come to her senses in just the nick of time, saves Fireheart, uh, but sadly at the cost of her last life. In her final moments, she's surrounded by her two kits and she entrusts Fireheart with the future of ThunderClan as he has now become Firestar. Woo! That was a really good summary. Thank you. Woo! Oh, thank you, Jose. That was a lot of stuff in that book. I hope I got There is. This, oh, this is a a dense book. Let's just begin with that. This There's a lot that happens here. You know what else, though? I felt like it's the best of the dense Warrior Cats books we've read so far. I, I agree. This was a stronger one um, compared to some of the other ones that... I guess what, I think what helped was that it felt like it have an, had an overarching plot to it. Like the threat of the dogs 
was consistent. Mm. So it didn't feel like several small stories stitched together. There was always that sort of consistent looming threat throughout the book. Yeah, there was like a good through line rather than just it being sort of a series of vignettes that are, you know, barely connected to each other. I have the suspicion that Warrior Cats books like number of every series, it's like number one, three and six are going to be the standouts. But honestly, for this one, I would say three, five, and hypothetically six, which is interesting because the books in between often feel uh, like they're they're just there to progress the plot. After reading Rising Storm, which was a book that just kind of felt like getting us to a point, I felt like this one, I was in it. Yeah, like there, it had its own conflict and tension and it had its own like plot trajectory outside of the trajectory of the entire series Uh, so it is able to stand on its own yeah I agree yeah it kind of made me feel like oh they they cracked the code they figured it out this is when these books get consistently good (laughs) is I hope that's not a horrible thing to say when you think about like Rising Storm you're like I um I think that's the one with Fire Heart and Sandstorm becoming a thing I don't know you know but when you think about like this one you're like oh my god it's the one with the dogs that was crazy yeah. it's got something about it which is reminiscent of like spoilers but there are upcoming warrior cats books where it's like oh it's the one with the cult you know <laughs> or oh this is the one where they go on that big perilous journey mm-hmm. I just want to see this format continue I'm just so excited about that cult spoiler to be honest <laughs> I wow okay it's a Mark long it ways off. <laughs> yeah. See, as a kid, Power of Three was my favorite. So I'm yeah. like biased toward- Gosh, like, Power of Three really is so good. It. it is so good. Oh man, honestly. Is that the next one? No. Yeah. It's, the, oh. it's the one after that, but it's- Okay. The next one is, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fine. That's a great way to put it. <laughs> I'm curious to revisit it as an adult and be like, oh, this is a lot better than I remember because I remember just being like, this is okay as a kid. But I remember thinking these were amazing as a kid. This first, like, six. And the, everyone talks about how they're, like, the classics. Which is interesting because now as an adult, I'm witnessing a group of authors finding their footing. Yeah, it's definitely not consistent yet. <laughs> For better and worse. Maybe this is the book where it did? What do you guys think? I have no idea where it's going. So <laughs> I felt like this is the one where it did start to feel like it was coming together like it's it's gotten through a lot of the the early hiccups where it's just setting up this world, introducing these characters, establishing dynamics. Like there's a lot of stuff in this forest that just needed to be put together too, right? So I mean, I'm sort of like I that's how I kind of look at the earlier books, and this one it feels like they're finally doing stuff. Like you've built all this this cool world, and now you're like you're telling stories in it, and like there yeah, are payoffs, but there's also like hints for the future. It's just. This was a really strong book in the of the five we've read. I agree. Yeah, I, I agree. It definitely has, I don't know, it, it doesn't really fall prey to the some of the pitfalls that the earlier books fall into, like you were saying, Jose, with all they're doing is building and they, they can't actually do anything with what they've built yet. But this one does finally feel like, okay, we have this world, we have these characters, we have, you know, motivations and stuff already built up. Let's do something with it. Oh, can I ask one question, actually? Uh, I wish I had the book in front of me, because I guess this is just a question of how these were produced, because the first few of these books I've read were all, I mean, these are all coming from the library, but they're all like the very first editions with the original covers, and they have like those nice, lovely maps. But for some reason, the the library only had the the recent edition for this one with the the weird hyper realistic covers. Aren't of they the hideous? Hideous. But that, Sorry, that wasn't the mean. only thing they changed. <laughs> Um, like there was a different map on the inside. What? Like they changed how the map was drawn. How dare they? That's unacceptable. So, I'm wondering if either of you know anything about this. Like why did they change the map? No, that's weird because like I've started getting all these TikTok memes that are like, you finally made it. You're here and you open your eyes and it's the Warrior Cats map. You know, it's like when you pass on. <laughs> the meme is like when you die, the last thing you see is the map from Warrior Cats. I don't know. <laughs> If anyone else is getting this, I have no idea what you're talking about. I am not on TikTok. Sorry, so I... it's a, it's like a it's a, it's definitely like a Gen Z TikTok meme. Can't relate. It's, <laughs> but that map is iconic. It is. Yeah, I'm I'm like genuinely upset that they changed it. That is, I'm like hurt. I feel betrayed. In fact, 
so the original Warrior Cats artist was Wayne McLaughlin. I just think he's a genius. But then he passed away. Uh, so then they were left with this, like, do we hire an imitator? Or do we hire someone to do different designs for the rest of... And I don't love the direction they've gone in. Now the designs are done by Owen Richardson. They changed the Wayne McLaughlin covers, and that bugs me, because he did more than just covers. He did, like, these richly illustrated book jackets that, like, span the whole way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you look at them, and you're like, especially as a kid, and you're like, wow, these are some beautiful paintings. And then the Owen Richardson covers just kind of look like a a wide-angle lens close-up of a cat. Yeah, even as a a kid, the original covers feel felt artistic and they felt like no other book had book jackets like that and then now like I as an adult especially you know look at the new ones and just see some like you know not to disrespect that artist's work um they're more talented than I will ever be at art oh yeah absolutely but it feels more like commercialized I guess it feels like they're not taking these like artistic risks and really you know investing in the artistry of the design I'll just I'll just say it in a series where things can often blend together the covers are one of those things that make the books like distinct in your mind Mm -hmm. because there was always something like new and interesting that McLaughlin was exploring about the world specifically what sticks out in my mind is like the old versus new cover of Twilight but not Twilight Twilight Warriors the new prophecy Twilight yeah, that's one of the one of the books in the next series that we will be reading. And I will send you guys an image of what the old cover looks like next to the new cover. Actually, while we're sending images, let me send you the two maps. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's the original and like that's the new one. Oh, I wouldn't mind the new one honestly, but they why did they change the clan I, logos? I hate it. I hate it. That's bizarre. The angle of it is wrong. The most iconic iconography in the series. Why would they change that? Oh my god, sorry. Now I feel like I'm being like a defensive warrior cat's like nostalgia stickler. <laughs> and I apologize, but look, like, they just don't make them like they used to. But like, look at these covers. Oh, look how the original yeah. is like, what if we explored like the rock faces in this world? Mm-hmm. And we showed like a bunch of cats hanging out on them, right? And then the new one is like just a zoomed in bewildered looking cat. It looks like the kind of picture that I would take of my cat if I wanted to make fun of him by doing a close-up at a bad angle i was actually thinking this like my like if i had a cat and he found my phone and accidentally like took a selfie i love that that's a universal experience (laughs) well because the front teeth of cats like cats front teeth are so dumb looking they're funny because they're just they're just nubs and if you like lift up their little like front lip they look so dumb And I love it. And that is like the most unflattering angle of a cat that you can get. And I love that this, they didn't put in the teeth because they're cowards. But if this were a real cat, you would be able to see its nubby little teeth and it would be very silly. I've got a (laughs) few like unflattering close-up shots of my cats that I will now send to the group chat. And I think we could totally Photoshop them into the like new Warrior Cats books. (laughs) Yeah. I, oh this my is, gosh. Uh, photographing them at like a hideous angles is my passion, actually. Because cats are so like majestic. There's, you know, the stereotype of cats being very like vain and, you know, they, they groom themselves a lot. And so they must care about their appearance. And so when you can find a silly picture of them, it is worth everything. <laughs> Zoe, I know you have opinions on hyperrealism not necessarily being the best. Me? End of uh, sentence. Why, 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 why would you make you think that? Do you think that <laughs> applies to the new covers? Yes. Uh, so there's a video. I don't know if I would call it a video essay, but there's a there's a video on YouTube of a creator called... <laughs> Yay, love him. I feel I have mixed feelings about his content. It's sort of like junk food for me. But he has a video where he talks about the remake of The Lion King. And the remake of The Lion King was made to be this like hyper realistic, looks like very CGI animations of these African creatures that are supposed to look super realistic. And His main critique, what it comes down to, because the video is incredibly long, I think it's actually broken up into two like multi-hour parts. What his critique comes down to is that making your animals more realistic 
actually often hurts your storytelling. When the animals are supposed to be the main characters that we as the audience relate to, having them be hyper hyper realistic is damaging because the thing about animals is that in real life, animals' faces and bodies do not move the way that human faces and bodies move. Except for my cat Smudge. He's got a very human face. Those like... Okay. (laughs) So all animals except... Lola's cat Smudge. Who was named after the warrior cat Smudge, of course. Of course. I I had, I wished in my heart of hearts that that was true. Thank you for confirming. Uh, I'm also sending you more nubby little teeth pictures of my cat. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Nubby little teeth. Uh, Anyway, you know, part of the reason why the original Lion King movie worked so well is because it was not CGI animated. um, and, And the characters were not realistic in the way that they were illustrated. And so you were able to get these very human emotions on their faces and in their posture and things like that. And you only get that with less realistic, less detailed illustrations. You you can't get that with hyper-realistic CGI animals because that's just not how animals look. And so it's, it's almost like this, you have a spectrum from on one end hyper-realism and on the other end relatability. Now, obviously, it's not that simple, but all of that is to say, yeah, I I do think that having more realism in animals, in the illustration of animals, leads to less emotion and less emotiveness uh, in their faces. And that is something that we lose with these new covers. Have you guys seen uh, Live Forever? Oh my gosh, I love these pictures. (laughs) Thank you. Have you guys seen Live Forever as you are now? No. Alan Resnick joint. Um, love him. Wham City Comedy icons. I'm going to say definitely my favorite internet creators. Except for us, of course. Obviously. And also, I don't know if they would like technically count as like internet creators. They're just indie. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I don't want to go into the whole premise. Okay. It's too much. But there's this bit where he's like explaining the uncanny valley and he's like, Mm. so let's say you bump into a rock and and it stubs your toe and you're like, darn, that's a rock. But then you put some googly eyes on the rock and you're like, oh, it's getting kind of cute, you know, and do a little smile and that's even cuter. And then you start to put your lunch ham on it to make it look like human skin. And then you've entered the uncanny valley. But we have Mm -hmm. successfully bridged the uncanny valley you know because and everyone's always doing that like including tron legacy they're like we have defeated the uncanny valley no you have not um james cameron thinks that he has defeated the uncanny valley Mm -hmm. and i am here to tell him he has not defeated the uncanny valley but neither do these book covers these book covers are very look we did it it's not uncanny valley but then like they're so hyper realistic plus human emotions that it just enters this surrealist space Mm -hmm. and not surrealist in in the good fun interesting way no not at all. Also, I love how we're judging a book by its cover right now. I mean, it's not like anyone has ever told us not to do that. I mean, technically, we're just judging the cover by itself. We're, yeah. I, I'm not besmirching the interiors of uh, these we just books. We did how just we say that book. we liked it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> these are Smudge's sneezing pictures. <gasps> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That was the best. Oh my gosh. Thank you. I love your passion for my weird cat and his weird teeth. I feel like that one picture is like the one he would uh, get on his publicist to get removed from the internet. <laughs> the winking one? Yeah. <laughs> so good. Especially because Smudge is an extremely like beautiful cat and he's so photogenic and everyone's always like, oh my God, Smudge is the most beautiful cat ever. So I, I get him vulnerable enough to take these extremely unflattering pictures and then people are like, how did you even get that out of him? What are you doing to him? So Charlie, my my little orange cat, he looks like a goblin, like an actual like <laughs> gremlin creature. My mom was visiting uh, a couple weeks ago and as a term of endearment, I would call him a little goblin and tell him how, you know, <laughs> creepy he was because I love him. And my mom got upset. She was like, oh no, Charlie, don't you listen to her. Mom. You are so cute. And I'm like, mom, like I... I'm telling him that he's a a creepy little goblin boy because I love him. And it's like she didn't understand that calling him a goblin and a gremlin was and like a little monster and, you know, telling him that I wanted to just like eat him, uh, that that was a term of endearment. She didn't get that. But I feel like that is a very cat owner thing to do is to 
you know, there, there's a joke on the internet uh, that I see. I, I think it started on Tumblr is where I first saw it. That is, you know, dog owners talking about their dogs. And Reginald. Like, oh, this is, you know, this beautiful, yes, who is a purebred, whatever, whatever. We, we paid $10,000 for him. And then it's cat owners. And they're like, oh, yeah, this is George. I uh, found him in a dumpster out, out back of a, of a Taco Bell. I love him. <laughs> I mean, it also applies to, like, your relationships with humans, right? Some people are like, this is my... I mean, okay, I don't want to say I'm not this. Like, okay, actually, this is a great point. I am like, this is my darling, dearest, my most beautiful, ethereal girlfriend. And my girlfriend is like, this is my stinky little girl. She's disgusting, <laughs> little gremlin. I'm sorry, Jose, is this is this too cat owner specific? Is this like an alien culture to you? No, it's fine. It's, it's giving my face a little time to warm up. <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> I was outside a lot, oh, and it's I very windy and cold. Oh, I thought you meant like cold. your face was stiff so. and not doing like proper emotional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. It's it's in my uh, my patrician facade doesn't uh, change very much, but I can assure you, my heart is breaking. Wow, you didn't even get that All one, right. Lola. Oh no, I did. It was funny. It's just that I'm also <laughs> laughing at these pictures I've taken of my cat, and I didn't realize I'd taken so many unflattering pictures of these cats. And now it's like, oh, this isn't just a hobby. This is a passion. <laughs> this is a calling. I bet there's a market for that. Oh, there is almost definitely a market for that. <laughs> you just got to make sure no one's taken it already. It's all me. It's just me. I'm the entire market. <laughs> Zoe, if you pay me, I will. I yes, all of them, please. <laughs> But this is going to be really fun to edit. There's just going to be a huge swath of like 20 minutes that are just like, yoink. This is the part where we talked about pictures. So, well, so the the intro, I think it's just the prologue, actually, that there might be a couple of other sections, uh, come to us from a human perspective and like from the dog's perspective. And it's difficult for me to really like piece together what is happening from the human's perspective. And like there are times where the cats see these two legs and are describing like what they're wearing and what they're doing. And I'm trying to understand like, okay, in the human world, who, what, what, who are these people? What are they doing? You know, what are these like uniforms that they're wearing? What are these dogs? Um, what sort of breed are they? Things like that. I firmly believed, and I don't know if I still believe this, but as a kid, I firmly believed that these were lab beagles. Really? Yeah. But oh. since then, I've owned hound dogs, and I feel like portraying them this way is disrespectful. Because hound dogs are much smarter and more independent than this. They got big personalities, man. So my issue with them being hound dogs, first of all, I do, I also love hound dogs, is that I think that they're the wrong I don't know that they're described that way uh, because they're described as being these like incredibly gigantic creatures I almost wonder if they're like wolf dogs I'd assume they were like some a larger kind of dog like a rottweiler or something I have a German shepherd and she is quite large um she's a 75 pound German shepherd um big big girl we stand she yeah she's uh the sweetest she is afraid of people, um, but she's very sweet once she gets to know you. Uh, give me a second. I'm going to try and find where they're describing the dogs. I know there's something at the end. Honestly, I'm digging the chaotic energy of this episode. <laughs> I've got to say. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, I won't spend a bunch of time trying to find it. But these dogs are described as being huge. Um, even in relation to the two legs. The thing is, my dog is, what, three or four times the size of my cats. And my cats are, well, one of them is perfectly average sized and the other one is a giant chonker. Oh gosh, <laughs> what, a, what a millennial thing to say. Uh, I was just saying, I was like, don't say it, don't say it. <laughs> don't call her millennial, it's so mean, it's rude. Don't be Listen, rude I'm, to your co Listen, I'm on the edge, okay? I'm... Depending on who you ask, I'm either a millennial or a Gen Z, so I'm allowed to do both. You are not a Zoomer because you just said chonker. I say things that mil that millennials don't understand. That's true. That ends, I'm no, but chonker. 
yeah but also shit. i don't know why i'm making fun of you so hard it's a force of habit i guess what a gen z thing for you to do <laughs> so it, both of my cats are not that much smaller than my dog so i didn't really understand what these dogs were supposed to be and there was part of me that thought maybe they were wolf dogs i don't know if people in the uk have wolf dogs um i know that is a thing more here in the u.s part of One of the clues that I could use to figure out what kind of dogs these are is to figure out who the people are, because if they're, you know, police officers or, you know, firefighters, then that could help narrow it down. Not that all firefighters have Dalmatians. Are they rogue police dogs? That would be cool. That was a thought. But it was also difficult for me to understand who the humans were, too, because they were described as, like, all wearing, like, these blue... I think they were, like, these, like, blue jumpsuits or something. I was wondering if it's, like, is this a British thing or something? Like, would I know this if I lived in the UK? It's like, oh, yes, the the, the dog wrangler or something. (laughs) Dog guys who just... Have a bunch of dogs and walk around in blue uniforms. Those oh, yeah, guys. isn't that the isn't that the plot of um Oliver and Company? No, what's the one with the they they kiss over spaghetti? Lady and the Tramp. One. Lady and the Lady Tramp. Lady and the Tramp. Yeah, isn't that the plot of Lady and the Tramp? Or there's like a dog catcher. I know that's like a thing from 1950s America. <laughs> Don't ever make me dislike Lady and the Tramp ever. Oh no, again. I love Lady and the Tramp. Okay, I'm one of my favorites as a kid. That and the Aristocats were my two Typical. faves. I know. Cat person. I know. <laughs> well, and that's not the only thing that you would understand more if you were in the UK, because I'm sorry to have to break this to both of you, but uh, something that is brought up in this book is hedgehogs. Oh, that pissed me off. Hedgehogs sorry. do not live in the United States. There are no hedgehogs that are native to uh, <laughs> well, this sorry, entire I don't continent. know how to explain. Was this a conversation we had? previously no what we had a conversation about before was badgers okay because i just had this conversation with my girlfriend because i was like i don't support hedgehogs being a part of the like forest creature canon Mm -hmm. unless you're in the uk i find it disturbing i find it try hard you're in the united states and you're like oh forest creatures like hedgehogs are you kidding no and you know why because that position has already been taken by the much maligned skunk yes yes Skunks deserve to have the merch that hedgehogs have. They are so cute. Just look at Bambi. I, I, feel, I feel very, I feel weirdly passionate about this. I'm sorry. Just look at Bambi, okay? You have your deer, your bunny, and who else? That's right, a skunk. What, any hedgehogs? No. Also, it's like foxes are try hardy enough because foxes don't live like in much of the United States. Like, they're extremely adaptable, don't get me wrong, they will be here eventually, but, like, they're, like, forest creatures, like, foxes, I'm, like, we have, like, lynxes and coyotes here. Yeah. So, I'm, like, foxes are try-hardy enough, hedgehogs, that's full chug. Now you've, now you've shot the moon. It's not appropriate. And then I talked to my girlfriend about it, and she was, like, hedgehogs are just a normal, sorry, but hedgehogs are just a normal forest creature (laughs) here. Beautiful. (laughs) So, this might be very, like, too on brand Appalachian of me, but may I throw a hat into the ring? Yes, ma'am. Possums. Possums are actually incredible creatures. I agree with that. They eat all the bad things. They can't get rabies. Let me look that up because I feel like that's true and now I'm worried that's that I'm going to say it. That's true of humans. They're extraordinary. That's, yeah. Can't get rabies. Correct. Uh, well, they say almost never. Yeah, possums do not carry rabies. Possums' body temperature is too low uh, to be able to incubate rabies. Also, they are one of very few marsupials in the world. Aren't they North America's only native marsupial? I believe so. And also, if you look at their faces, they are so cute. They are just incredible creatures. I love them so much. They are one of the forest creatures that we should have in our traditional canon, and yet we are so smitten with this British canon of uh foxes and hedgehogs that we don't, don't bring foxes here. into this foxes are fine we have we have <laughs> foxes in the americas i just they're just not let, as common let me clarify 
let me clarify. I think we should have national pride in possums and all this, but also encountering a fox in the wild was a genuinely magical experience for me. That sounds magical. You know, and that was in North America. So I'm like, don't get me wrong. Don't get it twisted. Oh yeah, they're just they're just not as common here as they are. They there. can be a part of the canon. That said, like you occasionally see them here and it's like a magical experience, but then like when you're in the UK, <laughs> <laughs> my my girlfriend's always telling me about how they're like destroying her mother's garden and she just lets them because they're cute you know what we don't have as part of our canon of forest creatures here groundhogs well i think you, you're kind of hitting on something why a lot of these animals don't make it into the canon it's because often they're just seen as like pests like possums or i, I don't know that always makes me think of like varmints that get hunted down and in, in some varmints, weird part of I, the I world won't, don't get me wrong groundhogs are varmints that's what i'm saying that's the, okay yeah. if you're gonna make the distinction between varmints right then why but are why aren't they canon they are as varmints possums are good and groundhogs are not and yet both of them are excluded why exclude one and not the other you understand they're, what i'm they're trying the to same say category as skunks raccoons all these like little furry creatures that we've just decided are pests and they don't have like the magic of things like a hedgehog because we don't see those everywhere. It is worth mentioning that garbage creatures are beloved by the internet, right? Yes. So like your raccoons, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, opossums. Uh, but then I see people being like, well, I think we should all, we should just throw all rodents into that category, all varmints into the garbage category, because isn't it so cute? I'm like, no, because like, first of all, rabbits aren't rodents, so don't yeah. go there. Makes me feel insulted as someone who likes rodents even. Oh yeah, rodents are phenomenal. Also, hedgehogs aren't rodents. That's a whole, they're a whole separate thing, but. Right. Yeah. I'm like, don't you dare oversimplify. I don't resent hedgehogs. Like, period. But I especially don't resent hedgehogs because they're rodents, because they aren't rodents. And ditto rabbits. Whenever someone's like, we can remove rabbits from the forest canon, I'm like, you are, you're Excuse over. You're me? done. I don't know if you can remove rabbits. They're too yeah, essential. That's, that is vile. <laughs> this is the funniest conversation I've ever had. <laughs> and I will be keeping it in. I don't know why, but when there is a commonly disliked animal, I get suspicious. Mm -hmm. So then I take the side of the animal. Um, and then people are like, oh, yeah, but they're actually like horrible little creatures who do this, that and the other. And then I'm like, why did I doubt my own kind? Why did I feel the need to like stick up for the underdog? Because um, my whole life I've been like weasels, love them. Stop insulting them. They are really cute. Okay, sometimes you're right, though. I, I still get comments under the video to this day about pit bulls and how people just hate on them relentlessly. And they're, they did nothing wrong. They're just dogs that got a bad rep so we talked about some of the meta stuff well let's get into some of the more negative stuff we've been pretty positive about these books except for the art perhaps but i there were some issues that i had on the level of like the writing and the plot structure and things like that and i think that might be a good place to start to get us into some of our criticism of this incredibly uh dense tome of cat i know that i have complained a lot in all of these episodes about cloud paw but oh my gosh i hate cloud paw i just hate cloud paw i think you mean cloud tail well he's cloud paw for most of the book to be fair would you like to elaborate on why and explain to our audience who that is <sighs> so cloud paw is the little white cat that is fire hearts uh, nephew. It is Fireheart's sister princess, had this kit, gave this kit to uh, Fireheart to take back to the clan to raise up to be a warrior, and that warrior became Cloud Kit, now Cloud Paw, now finally Cloud Tail, and he has always struggled with fitting in. In this book, as Jose alluded to in his uh, summary, Cloud Paw is incredibly skeptical of star clan and all of the you know mysticism and religion and he's like a 14 year old atheist skeptic basically he is, he is an edgy atheist in this book and it is as someone who went through a phase like that i don't we all cannot stand it i find it so irritating Actually, I never did go through an edgy atheist phase. I, really? I like, yeah, I know. I, I, I say like it's relatable. It's actually not because I just leapt straight into like 
other forms of um, spirituality, honestly. I can even, I can do you one better than even just an edgy atheist phase. I was not only an edgy atheist when I was like 19 years old. I was also a libertarian. Zoe. Wow. I know. It was terrible. <laughs> I'm shocked. It was it was a good like year and a half, two years of my life. My first two years of college were that. You were a libertarian in college? Well, yeah, I was like super conservative Christian while I lived at home. And then it wasn't until I went out into the world where I was like, oh, things are different. And then it went immediately, you know. It's honestly like extremely cool. Is it? How much you've transformed. Yeah, like how much you've transformed as a person, like, and finding this out about you because you are one of the, like, sorry, not to gush, but you are one of the <laughs> kindest and most progressive people I know. Oh, thank you. So like hearing that you were an atheist libertarian is a little funky. It, you you seem happier now. I'll just say that. Oh, yes. Oh, it also, you know, it, anyway. Cloudpaw. Who is not a libertarian. As far as we know, who knows? You know, what is- <laughs> He's going to show up for the next one being like, of... you know, sharing this uh, kill pile seems kind of unfair. It seems like theft, if you ask me. Honestly, the disappointing thing about Cloudpaw <laughs> is he confirms all of the reasons why they don't generally let kitty pet into the clan yeah don't make me side with the nationalists here okay don't make me side with like the anti-immigration like i fundamentally believe that kitty pets should be allowed to join the clans but also it's so annoying when you meet someone who like goes to a different culture like moves somewhere else and is like ew you eat sushi here gross which you know and it's even worse than that because he's like oh, what you believe in divinity loser and then blue star is like this kid is so based and red pilled i'm gonna make him a warrior yeah it's the whole thing like between the two of them i mean blue star struggles a lot in this book and you know having her struggle on her own would be hard enough but having her then side with the incredibly irritating adolescent boy is it just it's too much it's too much for my heart to take there's a lot about how people like cloud paw but not a lot of that actually being demonstrated. Like we're told he's popular amongst like the apprentices and whatnot, but mm. it doesn't really come across because we, I guess we're only uh, seeing it from Fireheart's perspective and he's seen his nephew just never follow any of the rules or oh, have yeah, any of the Oh yeah, Fireheart kind of hates him. Yeah. It's almost kind of funny how much Fireheart, how frustrated Fireheart gets with him. Um, I also think it kind of sets a troubling precedent because like Cloudpaw acts so spoiled and entitled, but he didn't, he wasn't even kitty pet for very long at all. It's not mm -hmm. like he remembers being fed and pampered the way like mm -hmm. Fireheart literally does though. I just think the antagonism between them could be a lot stronger. Mm -hmm. That's one of the issues that I have with how he is characterized and how you know, his issues with the, just all of the customs and how he, you know, doesn't remember some of the important customs and how he doesn't believe in Star Clan and all that, how it, it, he's characterized in a way that makes it seem like those traits of his come from him being a kitty pet. But the thing is, he was brought to the clan so young that honestly, None of that makes sense. For basically his entire life, except for what, a few days, maybe a week or two, he, like, he should not remember his kitty pet life. And so all of his socialization should be from the clan. So he should have been socialized to understand the customs. Like, th there's no logical reason for him to not understand the things that he doesn't understand. Do you want me to blow everyone's mind here for a moment? Maybe we're putting things on Cloudpaw that we imagine on about him the same way Fireheart was doing that to Tiger Star's kids and only seeing, you know, the evil of Tiger Star, even though these kids did nothing wrong. Counterpoint Bramblepaw, <laughs> Bramblekit doesn't even talk or do anything, whereas Cloudpaw does actually do stuff that is objectively irritating but it's is someone allowed to be irritating <laughs> without us blaming where they came from may i clarify i have nothing to say 
Yes, go on. The reason, though, Cloudtail is so popular within the Warriors fandom is not because of this phase. <laughs> like, this edgy libertarian phase, because he goes through a massive redemption arc. Okay. So, I... <laughs> well, you just said he I was popular. I was like, that. wait, what? This cat cannot be popular. <laughs> I should clarify that to you, Jose. He actually became one of my favorite cats, eventually, um, well, like in the series story? as a child. I have no memory of enjoying his character, so we'll see if that... Don't call it a comeback. However, we're going to come back to him next episode and you're going to be like, oh, I actually like him. Or maybe it'll take a little longer than that. But I think you will come around. And I will say Lost Face, whose name does not remain that way, thank God, is one of my favorite characters in the whole series. If not my favorite character in the whole series. Yes, I agree. I'm glad her name doesn't stay that way because that was so mean. I'm yeah. just going to say, like, that's the thing that I think tipped me over to officially disliking Blue Star, despite... <sighs> How do you guys feel about Blue Star in this book? I think that she is upsetting. The thing about Blue Star is I, I think we should make space for cats to not be their best selves and to struggle with, you know, some trauma she's clearly gone through. The problem is when it happens to Blue Star, it affects everyone else. The whole clan has to pay for it. Uh, if anything, it's, I think, less poorly of Blue Star and more poorly on how this clan is structured where one person losing it or one cat losing it completely throws them into just disarray and they're like on the brink of war with multiple clans now because Blue Star just is having a rough time. This is me going out on a limb here. Do you think that this is a thinly veiled metaphor for criticism of the monarchy? I keep wondering that myself. <laughs> yes. But I don't know enough. Like I... I wish I could just have Tally reading along with me. I learn something new about England every day from her that makes me go, what? Knowing those cultural nuances would be awesome right now. And like, I, I get that, you know, the, the queen does not, well, rip, uh, the, the <laughs> chief monarch of the UK does not have, rip. you know, unilateral power. Like it's a head of, head of state, not head of government or whatever the monarch does not have actual power um in the way that the leader of the clan does i get that but you know maybe having this single person in charge uh with no real checks and balances is uh not good that's my hot take it's a good hot take <laughs> yes. my friend very bold stance um so i would like to segue quickly just slightly from lost face to sort of like just the general way that this book treats cats that are either physically or mentally or emotionally injured uh, or damaged in some way. Can't say I'm a fan. Lost Face, the naming of Lost Face genuinely is just cruel and vile and vicious and sick. <laughs> That's uh, all there is to say about it. And Something else that is really interesting is how this book deals with Snow Kit. So Snow Kit is another small white cat that everybody seems to like. They seem to play with him. He's very energetic. But some of the older warriors have noticed that Snow Kit doesn't really, the way that he plays doesn't really look right. What it comes down to uh, when Fireheart goes in and talks to another warrior who has been keeping an eye on Snowkit, what he learns is Snowkit is deaf, um, just born without the ability to hear. They have like this whole conversation about what to do about it and what Snowkit's future is in the clan. I find it really concerning. Um, this is something that we've talked about on previous episodes. You know, cats who are injured or cats who are, for whatever reason, not able to fulfill their duties and, and quote unquote, pull their weight in the clan. What happens to them? And the, the answer is usually not good, is I think what we've learned. It's like uh, they only had one spot open for medicine cat. And if you can't be a medicine cat and you can't be a warrior then the clan just kind of discards you. One of the questions that I have uh, in my heart, in my soul, do you think that the writers chose this outcome so that the clan wouldn't have to decide? Why even include it in the first place then? 
That's a good question. Because to me, this feels like another strike against like the leadership style of Blue Star. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you guys remember in the first book when we were like, why are their cats named like One Eye? Oof. <laughs> well, now we know how that happens. And so it gives like Fireheart an opportunity to abandon old practices, but also witnessing this happen. This foreshadows, I think, that he's going to care more about, like, cats with disabilities. At the same time, like, we are more horrified, the audience, than, like, the cats are in this moment. Yeah. It's like, I think what they were trying to do is is Fireheart being like, I'll never let that sort of thing happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll take care of him. I'll, you know, be there for him. But, like, if, if there is ever a cat who is deaf or blind or whatever like we need to create a clan that takes care of each other but i don't think we ever like actually got that breakthrough from him no at least not explicitly in this it was more Maybe just in the shock book? it was yeah i think it was like a lot of it was the fact that it was an omen and a sign from star clan that there was a problem within their in thunder clan i mean it's pretty heavy-handed you know symbolism a bird in the house literally was death for one of the cats here and that seems to be how the cats took it uh, and understood it, that they are in crisis and Star Clan is unhappy with them. I don't know if it was a moment for reflection. But it also sucks that like they had to be taught that lesson through the death of a child. You know, that's... It's unnecessary, frankly. Yeah, I, I'm also just like very sensitive to that in media. I don't like it when things happen to children, especially needlessly. Um, I don't think that it's a really good uh, thing to do just to show that, you know, something is bad or something is evil or to teach a lesson or whatever. I just don't personally really like that. But in this, it just, it, I don't know, it, it feels like a misstep on the part of the authors. Yeah. I, I'm not sure it was really necessary either. It's, uh, I mean, I think yes. we talked about women in refrigerators. This is a similar dynamic, except it, I think it's even worse if you do it to a kid. This is one of the most heavily criticized things in the series, if really? not the most criticized. Well, that's good. A at least the audience is on the right side of history here, I guess. <laughs> it's a weird thing in mm -hmm. what is otherwise a very strong book. I agree. Like when that happened, I suddenly was expecting this book to not be so great. I was like, oh, this is a book where stuff just happens like this. Luckily, that wasn't the case. It almost feels mm -hmm. distracting in, a, in an extremely like tense political situation. <laughs> this will be, I think, maybe my last like big criticism. But I do think that there was a lot of stuff, maybe not a lot. There were several scenes in this book that I think were not, I don't know, that were contrived or a little too heavy handed or a little too, I don't know, not the best way to handle things. So about in the middle of the book on page 126 of my copy, uh, Fireheart gets a vision from Spotted Leaf and Yellowfang. They tell him explicitly, hey, there is not going to be a battle here. Blood will not be spilled here. And like, I, I get <laughs> that, you know, these visions and, and prophecies and things are a way to foreshadow in a way to you know drive the plot in certain directions i get that that's the function of them in storytelling but this just felt silly <laughs> you know like i i don't know maybe i'm reading it a little too critically but it just felt silly for them to just straight up tell him no sorry there's not going to be a battle here okay bye yeah can't you guys be more cryptic and <laughs> serious back in my day prophecies were delivered in code yes speaking of at the end of the book when blue star is like i had my doubts about naming you firepaw because i didn't know if you would save the clan but then you did i was like wait what yeah, it feels very like a reversal of how prophecies work, right? <laughs> I feel like it, it's like a not a self fulfilling prophecy, but it is a prophecy that one has fulfilled independently of like the powers that be. Yeah, so maybe she never really came around on the whole Star Clan thing at the end. <laughs> so another not to pile on Blue Star here. But another sort of contrivance that I really hated in this book. Yeah, take that, Blue Star. Is that there's a part not that far after the section that I just read um, on page 177, Blue Star goes missing. She disappears. And it's this like big like panic. Everybody's like, oh no, Blue Star is sick and now she's missing. What is going to happen? What is she going to go do? And then a couple pages later, she comes back. And is like, oh yeah, I went to uh, talk to Star Clan to yell at them, 
and now I'm back. And and it was like, what? Why did you? Why? Why was that a whole thing? Why did she have to quote unquote go missing? Why was it this like? Like it, it, they brought it up like it was going to be this like actual important plot point, And it was just like, she already hated Star Clan. I don't know what, I don't understand the point of that. I'm going to defend that. Okay. Actually. Okay. Because I think her behavior at that point is becoming increasingly erratic and mm. unpredictable. And when someone is sick and just goes missing and then shows up a couple days later, like, unfortunately, a circumstance I have been in, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's like, what were you doing wandering around Beaverton in a onesie? Yeah, I guess it, I think they could have made it more clear. You guys know Euphoria. Have you seen Euphoria? No, I've seen bits, but yeah. I haven't seen it, but I know of it. <laughs> I don't know why I even asked. There's this one character. <laughs> I'm sorry, we're millennials. <laughs> we don't watch shows about high schoolers oh my god <laughs> unless it's riverdale there's this one oh lord my mom i, mean, I only watch shows I from 20 years riverdale, ago so yeah to be clear <laughs> so like every friend group has that one character who is like the straight-edged one but like fantasizes about being like one of the bad kids you know what i mean and therefore she <laughs> is kind of one of the bad kids but she is also I... straight edge, right? And I know you relate. I hate that because that was me in high school. <laughs> Go on. That was me as well in high school. So like there's this there's this gal in the series and there's always one of these in every one of these teen dramas where they're like, hey, Lexi, I, uh, I need to pass a drug test and I can't. So can you please pee in this cup for me? Okay, so here's what, okay. What I'm trying to say <laughs> is that Fireheart is that friend. Blue Star is currently on her I can't pass a drug test. Ah. Like she's currently in her um thing. Yeah, she's <laughs> such a dissociative Sylvia Plath, Fiona Apple, whatever. <laughs> she's um, the I just dropped acid and drove yeah. downtown and now I'm here and you're gonna yell at me, but I don't care. I made it. Oh good God. <laughs> My friends in college. Reading that, it's like Yep. It's that's it the happens. vibe I got from it. Is it's like, you know when your friend just strays and does some crazy stuff and you have to pick Mm. up the pieces and you're like, why are you doing this? Yeah. I got a a slightly Mm -hmm. different vibe from Blue Star. It seemed like she was just getting old and it felt like more like she was entering a phase in her life where she didn't have the clarity or the sharpness she once had. And she's always thinking about her. Yeah. And she's always thinking about her kids and like, oh, I hope they're okay and healthy and happy and all this. Oh, that's not that old, right? Yeah. She's too angry. It's like being president. Being clan leader what, prematurely ages you. I have no idea. But also the only people who get it are already Unless old. Unless you are Fireheart. Bam. Ooh. Or Obama. Or Kennedy. Oh, he's... <laughs> maybe Fireheart, now Firestar, is the Obama of ThunderClan. Oh, no. <laughs> that is wild. That is what we have to name this episode. I'm sorry. Fireheart or Firestar is the new Obama. Or no, is Thunderclan's Obama. <laughs> I think that you guys are probably right. And that is probably the intended purpose of that. I think that it could have been made more clear. I am blaming my issue with reading this uh, on the authors. Typical so millennial to refusing to take the blame. <laughs> I know. Typical red comp <laughs> major and not a literature major behavior. <laughs> what niche well, jokes I thought that it was no funny one because I was a literature appreciate. major. Appreciate. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Zoe, behave. <laughs> Ouch. Literature people are just weird and boring. <laughs> you don't love us? Is that it? I know. I'm sorry. Wow. Okay. I think lit people. If you are... don't say lit people are lit right <sighs> now. They read too much to be normal. Thank you. Well, okay. So one, lit people are lit. Two, lit people read too much to be, to have like functional brains. I cannot imagine reading that much. I can't imagine putting myself through that much reading. Okay. I don't like it. Not to get like way too personal, but honestly, I'm grateful (laughs) to be doing this podcast because I have to read at least one book per week. But also once I start reading, it's hard to stop. So I will like read a book and I'll be like, that was amazing. All right, on Mm -hmm. to the next one. And I found myself, I've read like 50 books this year so far. So I'm I'm in a good place because I was reading like 100 books per year was the goal for a couple (laughs) years. And this year, I think I'm going to surpass previous incarnations of myself and my reading abilities. And that's, it feels good. That is like absolutely wild. What, like reading 100 books per year? Yes. (laughs) I, I literally cannot imagine. 
But I mean, also like I, not that what you're reading is trash. That is not what I'm saying here. But also like, I don't know. I've been trying to make my way through uh, this one book that is literally like written in code and you have to like decode it. And there's like literal like physical artifacts that you have to use to like try and understand the book. And like that one has taken me like two months to read. So like 100 <laughs> books per year, one book every four days. That's that's crazy. I can't. Yeah. It depends how big the books are, I'd imagine. Although, I mean, that's kind of why I also joined a book club too. So I could like have an excuse to read more books. And it's nice to have that kind of like little external push being like, oh, gotta, gotta get back to reading. Fine. You guys are I'm just not better, than to be me. better than I you, get but it. Also, <laughs> I don't know. I know. I know. I'm just, I'm very, I am impressed. I, I am genuinely impressed by because I am obligated to push back on this narrative that like being well read takes a lot of time. You know what I mean? Like that it's not that it's not accessible, that it's not possible, you know, that I might as well not get into reading because like I'm like reading is so cool. Welcome to the magical world of reading. It's like my whole thing. I literally have one of your magnets on my fridge. Yes. (laughs) The reading is cool magnet. Yes. Yes. I will let you get back to your story. But when my mom was over a couple weeks ago, when she was getting something out of the fridge, she pointed at it and she was like, oh, is that your friend Lola? I was like, yeah, she's super cool. Hi, Zoe's mom. Oh my God. But yes. I'm sorry. Go on. No, it's fine. It's just that like reading, you know, I love it. It's cool. It Reading is so cool. And I don't think you have to just read like serious literature in order to be considered like a reader. Um, for example- Which is why we're doing this podcast. Every time I attend a play, I will write mm. it down in my book journal and I'll count it as one of the books I read that year because if you think about it, plays are meant to be seen, mm-hmm. but they are works of literature. Mm-hmm. So they're in that like in-between space. So like- <gasps> well. I yeah because I guess now that I'm thinking about it I always say like oh like yeah I don't read that much but because I don't read that much fiction like I read maybe four or five fiction books a year I read nonfiction like crazy so like I do I guess I am reading it's just not fiction which is I think most when people talk about reading I guess that is normally what they're talking about. One of my biggest pet peeves, the idea that like you need to read exclusively fiction because it makes you more literate. And I'm like, man, people are depressed. People are lacking in motivation. It's just good to like read. It's like when people complain, I don't care what you're reading, just read. Like, I don't care if it's graphic novels and comics and manga. Mm -hmm. In fact, do it. Like I read tons of that and you should consider it reading. And then when people like are like nonfiction doesn't count, audiobooks don't count. I'm like, so what you're saying counts as exclusive exclusively like literary fiction that's not fair yep. because the majority of yeah. like heavy readers it's like we all love watching like intellectual video essays but we do also consume mm-hmm. garbage youtube because mm-hmm. everyone also consumes garbage youtube so if reading is going to be yep. a part of your life you shouldn't like disparage as far as i'm concerned if you got it from a library it is a step up yeah it just it seems like snobbery to me whenever people get on stuff like that read something you want to read not something you feel like people think you should read because like what's the point of that and you're never going to enjoy reading if you're like reading because like oh i i, I got to pick this up because this is what's expected of readers and also like whenever you talk to someone as a literature person like Ooh. there are so many books i haven't read there's so many and everyone just assumes like oh you've read all the classics it's like no do you know how many there are a lot <laughs> they're like huge gaping holes in my like things i haven't yeah. read and things i hope to read one day but uh, I don't know. I'll get around to some of them, I guess. There is this approach, uh, this this snobby approach to teaching reading. That's like you have to read this because it's one of the great works. Instead of mm-hmm. like engaging you emotionally and intellectually and like imaginatively in the world, all the best English teachers I ever had would take something like dense, like Moby Dick, and they would be like, isn't this so fun? Because it is. Because once you get Mm -hmm. in that mindset of like, this is a really fun, cool, interesting, fascinating book with crazy new stuff at every turn, I just start like devouring the book. You know what I mean? Once I get into that frame of mind. I will will always defend to the death Boz Lerman's Romeo plus Juliet. Me as well. Because it is a widely (laughs) accessible Romeo and Juliet that is so fun and it gets people in Shakespeare. Yeah, it's so good. And I say this as someone who was like all throughout college, like, I just don't think Shakespeare is that great. It's like, okay. (gasps) Oh, no, you were one of those. No, I need to clarify because it's like, 
yes, of course I like Shakespeare, right? Like I've, I've read, you know, if you're a person who loves books, you probably love Shakespeare, but also yes. like people favorite Shakespeare play go Macbeth, Macbeth, either Macbeth or King Lear for me. It's Othello or Much Ado About Nothing. See, that's my sister-in-law who was a literature major. She also, uh, Othello and Much Ado About Nothing. Least favorites go. Favorites. Mm, interesting. Oh, Gosh. One of the history ones, probably. Yeah. Mine is The Tempest. Really? Oh, really? Yeah, I, I was in I production really of The Tempest. I really do not I'll like The Tempest. Know. Oh. Um, we're going to have to unpack that at some point. But anyway. Anyway. Yeah. Go on. So, like, in college, I was like, you know, Shakespeare, he's great. He's wonderful. He's ph- phenomenal. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. I understand why he's important, but I don't understand why everyone's always going on about him. I read Othello, and that started to change me. Because Othello spoke to me, like, really deeply And it had, like, some of the most nuanced and complex dynamics Mm -hmm. of, like, race and sexuality and misogyny that I'd ever read in, like, any work of fiction. And it came out in the 1500s. So I was like, whoa. But then I saw this amazing production of Much Ado About Nothing. And I, I actually went back to the theater, like, three times. And I watched it over and over again. And I just think... No one should be shamed if what they, like, really want to read is Warrior Cats books, because once you're engaged, like, the engagement is good. Mm-hmm. In and of itself, the engagement is good. Well, I don't know why I'm getting emotional. Because <laughs> it's, I don't know. I So when I was, after college, but before graduate school, I took a year and I taught at this, like, after school test prep for, like, middle schoolers thing. It was really an awful system. Uh, but the kids that I interacted with, they were awesome. Um, love those kids. The kids are always awesome. The kids are great. Like middle schoolers. Yeah. They're, they can be cruel. They can be mean. They're kind of irritating, but they're, that age is incredible. Um, so I, there was one kid who the worksheet that he was working on was about understanding poetry. And he was so frustrated. He was like, I don't get this. This is dumb. Why? Like, what is the point of this? I forget what the actual poem was, but I talked him through it and ended up basically like taking it down to a word by word breakdown of the poem and helped him think through some of the, you know, like, okay, well, this image, what is this image doing? What does it, you know, evoke? Why do you think that the poet may have done that? Stuff like that. And at the end of it, I saw it like click into place for him. And he was like, oh, oh, that's like really cool. I hope that everybody gets to have the experience of having a conversation with a 12-year-old boy and then at the end of that conversation having them say, oh, that poem is cool because that was a just life-changing, like, yes, I, w- I want to do this forever. I love this. I want to keep doing this. That's very sweet. Kids fiction and working with kids on fiction. Love it. Love that we're having this conversation about why we do this, honestly, because it is the penultimate episode of this season. It is. Oh, gosh. And reading these books has me thinking about it a lot. So I think our audience will forgive us for divulging um, from the usual path and taking a more dangerous path. (gasps) Including... This dangerous path toward talking about... Such a good transition. Talking about... Do we want to talk about rituals or maternity? Do we want to do that? So ritual and maternity are kind of traced throughout this series. They're recurring themes. It feels like every book, there's like a new crop of kits or apprentices or warriors. There's like this consistent push to like get more cats in the clan. We need more cats. We need more warriors. We need more people hunting. And it's just the weird fusion between the two even like there's a highly regulated process like the kid is born then they stay in the nursery then they become apprentices and they become warriors and the whole time there's like a mystical step for each one where it's like the naming ceremonies and then we give them their proper warriors name and it's it's very like both things run through all of these books uh i don't know if this one was exceptional for either one of them to be honest but it was definitely there because it feels like it's always there and it's always a concern. Yeah, I think the only like big point that I think is worth bringing up with this one is with Blue Star because Blue Star, so much of the end and with her, you know, coming back into her right mind and doing this selfless act that ends up ending her life, it all comes down to her children, um, both her physical children that she bore and Firestar or Fireheart, who, you know, is throughout this first series, really her like adopted son. Um, I think there is a very clear like parent-child relationship between the two of them. And 
in my notes with the end, uh, I have written, All that Blue Star needed to repair her broken brain was to see the loyalty of her clan. All she needed to die happy was to have her children accept and forgive her. You know, she as the, like, matriarch of this clan, you know, the, the clan is her children and seeing them come together is what brings her back into herself and seeing her her literal physical biological children um come to her is what allows her to peacefully move on uh to star clan and i don't know i think that there is something powerful with that image again i i don't know if it's <laughs> i haven't really thought critically yet about whether you know that is a good thing or a bad thing and you know that this female character this like strong female character is at the end of the day um you know you could argue that she is now being defined by her motherhood i don't know what do you guys think i think blue star has always kind of got this sort of matriarchal quality to her because she's kind of like the mother of the clan in a mm -hmm. way too okay so blue star always has this very calm and just warm guiding presence in the, the early books feels like a, a very good mother figure and in this book she's just not that cat anymore um so like in some ways she was going back to the space that defined her but in a more i guess literal sense rather than being sort of a symbolic mother figure it's like she is an actual mother and maybe that means more to her than the sort of trappings and artifice of being mm. the clan leader through some sort of destiny she wanted sort of the real thing so in, in some ways it, it didn't feel like it was reducing her to motherhood mm -hmm. because that was in a way always part of her character yeah although it is great for people to be parents i don't know if i love the whole like blue star is exceptional for being like a strong female leader then what really redeems her is her like embracing her femininity mm -hmm. she's been just tough and icy and strong and cool and then she falls into this flea bag era and she gets all sad but then at the very end it's like and now i can die happily knowing that my children forgive me for abandoning them which don't don't get me wrong it made me cry but femininity being the answer motherhood being the answer to a woman's problems it's like inherently problematic, you know? I don't know if it was my favorite thing in the series, that's for sure. Yeah, I don't know. I like Blue Star. Me too. Yeah, me here. Me three. <laughs> me even. here. I was going to say, <laughs> I, I agree a lot with uh, what you're saying there, Lola, but I'm going to add something here to, to complicate it a little because another parent we've not talked about much is Tiger Star. <sighs> And I think one of the small examples we can see of him being in any way redeemable is that he does genuinely care about his kids and wants to have some kind of connection or relationship with them. And yeah, I can see why Fireheart is very uh, against that because Tiger Star just can't be trusted. But in some ways, for him, parenthood is where he's at least there's a sliver of, from my perspective, uh, goodness in him for such a bad cat generally and i don't know maybe this is sort of like an, an overarching theme in this book is that parenthood is uh, presents an opportunity for cats to do better and be better uh for the sake of their their kids tiger star being a really passionate dad not surprising honestly it makes sense with his character <laughs> yeah like he seems like the kind of dad that would get like way too into their kids like soccer game and like like yell at the other kids from the sidelines yes I, I feel like that's the kind of dad that he would be yeah he gives like the dad from clueless vibes <laughs> yeah he's like oh, oh my god the boy doesn't like you then clearly he's an idiot because you are the <laughs> yes. best because when you write a villain, you know, in a children's series, you're tempted to just be like, this is the worst person of all time. They have no redeeming qualities. But I like that Tiger Star has that redeeming quality of being really passionate about his kids. And I think his kids are better cats because of it. I should also mention that, like, people liked the Tiger Star as a dad dynamic enough that that was, like, the foundation of the whole, like, Tiger Star and Sasha series mm -hmm. of mangas. Which we will... Which we will, we will be reading those. on yeah. bonus episodes. Um, and Jose... Yeah, subscribe to the Patreon for those. 
see yeah link in the description for our patreon if you want access to those yeah so jose you'll get to see tiger star being um a dad quite a bit in the near future i'm just, I'm just glad my feelings for him are starting to get more complicated i've got two obituaries for this episode if we're interested yeah so speaking of uh blue star's death let's go through there are quite a few cat deaths in this book um i think it was one of the highest we had snow kit crooked star Graypool, Swiftpaw, Brindleface, and at the very end, last but certainly not least, Blue Star. Is that the most for one book? I don't, I think one of the previous ones had like eight, but I yeah, think- Yeah, I think maybe Rising Storm had more because of the fire. This is definitely a, a, a big one um, and lots of major, you know, Crooked Star and Blue Star. Like we lost two clan leaders um, in a single book. That's that is significant. I'm Googling which Warrior Cats book has the most deaths. Warrior death count infographic? Heck yeah. It's not totally accurate based on my own counting and cross-referencing with another. Because <laughs> to do this, I have my own count and then I have multiple other sources to make sure that I'm accurate. Uh. <laughs> um. Okay, so I think that this confirms my suspicions that book six, arc one has the most like cat deaths i think of literally like the whole series that's up to where i've read the end of the power three start of um omen of the stars i didn't finish omen See? of the stars and apparently book six and omen of the stars has a shocking 29 cat deaths oh wow that's wild well it's also supposed to be the conclusion of like the whole main oh. arc of the story because i think the series that have come out since then are like prequels oh. they're going back to like the founders of the clans they're doing sky clan stuff they have a series with blue star in it that's set before fireheart amazing and i also noticed it's interesting because we love power of three mm -hmm. and almost no one dies in that whole series it's like the amount that's of cats that died in this book alone is the amount of cats who die in the whole power of three. I don't know. I'm excited to... Oh my gosh. I don't know if you can hear my dog downstairs. She's so cute. Yeah. She's... It's because my husband went outside and without her. I might open my door and let her in. Uh, Lola, would you like to... Yep. Get us started with those obituaries. Who is going to be up first? I'm going to start with Crooked Star. Okay. Because I think it's going to provide some interesting tidbits. When Crooked Star was born, he was called Storm Kit. But a fall while playing broke his jaw and his mother, Rainflower, renamed him. Also, Rainflower? Imagine, like, lucking out with that name. <laughs> I want to be Rainflower? What the heck? It seemed to Crooked Kit that his mother never recovered from the disappointment of having a disfigured son. She showered attention on his brother, Oak Kit, instead, leaving Crooked Kit restless and discontent. He left the clan when he was still a kit and lived with farm cats instead learning to hunt through fields of wheat, free from the warrior code. But deep down, he was still a clan cat, and he returned home, was given the apprentice name Crooked Paw, and eventually earned the warrior name Crooked Jaw. In his dreams, he walked with Maple Shade, a cat with revenge in her heart, who let him assume she was from Star Clan, although she was confined to the Dark Forest. Ooh. She agreed to make him the most powerful River Clan warrior of all if he vowed that nothing would ever be more important to him than his clan. Crooked Paw could see no trickery in this and made the promise. Maple Shade trained him hard, honed his skills, but also expected Crooked Paw to stand by and watch as, one by one, the cats he loved most were taken away from him. Crooked Jaw proved his worth many times over with his skill at hunting on land and in the river. He never seemed to be able to do enough to please his mother, but he soon won the affection of his den mate Willow Breeze. Another great name, Willow Breeze. Maple Shade tested him by luring a two-leg kit to Willow Breeze, allowing her to be captured and taken back to two-leg place. Crooked Jaw rescued her with the help of her sister Graypool, and he knew exactly what Maple Shade had done he was beginning to realize that he had made a terrible promise that would leave him isolated in the midst of the clan, but Maple Shade would not release him. A stray dog in River Clan camp sent Crooked Jaw racing to help, but he was faced with the dreadful choice of saving his clanmates or rescuing his mother, who had been knocked into the river. Urged on by Maple Shade, Crooked Jaw went to help the other warriors, and Rainflower died. Crooked Jaw never forgot the moment when he lost his mother, and with her, the chance of ever winning her love. When Shellheart retired from clan deputy, the broken jaws of a pike on the fresh kill pile predicted that Crooked Jaw should take his place, 
despite being so young. Mapleshade took the credit for damaging the fish, and that night Crooked Jaw finally realized that he was being trained among the Dark Forest warriors and dissatisfied angry cats from other clans, including Thistleclaw of ThunderClan. Horrified that he'd been asked to kill to secure victory against the warrior code, Crooked Jaw vowed never to return, but Mapleshade reminded him of the promise he had made, and slowly, Crooked Jaw's world fell apart. His brother, Oakheart, fell in love with Bluefur, a ThunderClan warrior, and compromised his loyalty to RiverClan. An expedition to hunt rats in a nearby barn, suggested by Crooked Jaw, led to the death of Hailstar. I'm losing it. Plunging Crooked Star too soon into leadership, and then Green Cough took Willow Breeze and two of their new kitted daughters, leaving just one, Silver Kit, for Crooked Star to raise alone. For a while, Crooked Star thought Maple Shade's curse had lifted, but his daughter Silverstream fell in love with Graystripe, a ThunderClan warrior, and died giving birth to his kits on the other side of the river in the shadow of Sunning Rocks. Thanks to Maple Shade, Crooked Star had achieved everything he ever wanted and lost everything that mattered. It is to his credit that he hid so much of his private torment and was regarded as a strong, fair-minded leader throughout the forest. Whoa, what a guy. Sad story. I had no idea that much was going on. Apparently there's a book called Crooked Star's Promise. Ooh, that's probably where that came from. It's a super edition. Yeah, okay, but the idea that Silverstream died because she was cursed makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it makes me feel sad for her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she was just born into the wrong family. Man, she's like the Anastasia of the Warrior Cats universe. <laughs> I laughed out loud, but you couldn't hear it. <laughs> Let's move on to Blue Star. Woo! Blue Star, leader of ThunderClan before Firestar, Blue Star was a proud and deeply committed warrior. Once known as Blue Fur, her early life was scarred by tragedy. Her mother was killed during a raid on WindClan, and soon after, her sister, Snowfur, died on the Thunderpath. Isolated in her grief from her own clanmates, Blue Fur fell in love with a River Clan warrior named Oakheart. But their brief relationship ended when Blue Fur realized she could not be loyal to ThunderClan while her heart lay elsewhere. Unbeknownst to Bluefur, she was already expecting Oakheart's kits. Bluefur paid the highest possible price for her leadership, giving up her three tiny kits in order to become deputy instead of Thistleclaw, whom she feared would destroy ThunderClan with his dark-hearted ambition. Oakheart raised Stonefur and Mistyfoot, the two kits who had survived in his own clan. Bluefur told her clanmates that her litter had been stolen by a starving badger, and then overcame her sadness to become deputy and leader as she had hoped. When Blue Star was an apprentice, the ThunderClan medicine cat Goosefeather had delivered a prophecy to her. You will blaze through the forest like fire. Only water can destroy you. During her leadership, as ThunderClan struggled against its rivals, Blue Star looked to another source of fire, the red-pelted kitty pet Rusty, to save her beloved clan. But Blue Star's murderous deputy Tigerclaw continued to rage against ThunderClan, even after becoming leader of ShadowClan. He set a pack of ravenous dogs to raid the camp, and Blue Star gave up her ninth life to lead the dogs over the edge of a gorge, dying for the last time in water, just as Goosefeather had foretold. Star Clan showed enough mercy that Stonefur and Mistyfoot found Blue Star on River Clan's shore, and her final moments were spent making peace with her surviving children before she went to join her lost daughter, Moss Kit, in Star Clan. That's so sweet. It's good that, like, in the Warrior Cats universe, atheists can still go to the good place. Yeah, atheists can still go to cat heaven. It just, it's not about, like, whether or not you believe in cat heaven. It's about, like, whether or not you are a good cat. Cat heaven exists regardless. What I'm wondering is, like, do we know where bad cats the go? The dark forest. Okay. I don't know if it's been... Because I was going to say, there's no Christian analog unless you get hell I don't know if it's somehow. been explicitly said in this series, but I feel like it has in passing. Pour one out. Would we like to go ahead and give this book a rating out of 10? Mm -hmm. Jose, what would you rate A Dangerous Path? I mean, I'm looking at my previous ratings. Yeah, Zoe, remind us where the rankings are right now, please. So currently, Forest of Secrets, which is book three, is far and away number one mm -hmm. with nine points. Then we have Into the Wild, the first book, which Jose and I gave a seven and Lola gave a six. Then there is Fire and Ice, which is book two, and Jose and Lola gave that a five, I gave it a four. And then we have Rising Storm, which Jose and Lola gave fours, and I gave a three. So this book, how's it rank? I'm going to give this one an eight. An eight? Yeah, I really enjoyed nice. it. Jose, what about you? See, I, I think I liked it a little more. I'm like debating whether or not I like this more than Forest of Secrets or not, but I feel like I'll keep it at a nine. I'm Okay, so like the two points I'm knocking off are like... Snow Kit, 
and like blue stars the questionable stuff with blue star i wish that we could do half points me too because i see i don't in my heart i want to give it a seven but i gave into the wild a seven and this is better than into the wild it is but i just very much it is but i i don't know i think it's maybe going back through and, and actually like reading through a lot of the criticism that i had where i'm like yeah this book did have a lot of low points but I think that maybe those are just inflated because we discussed them. So yeah, I'll go ahead and give it an eight, which means that A Dangerous Path is our second favorite book of these so far. But we will see how this ranking turns out after our next episode where we cover the final book in the series, The Darkest Hour. Woo! This is my favorite book in the series as a child, so I'm so psyched. Thank you so much for listening Please remember, help to control the pet population and have your pets spayed and neutered. And until next time, with our final episode of this series, oh my God, I'm so excited. we have been so the excited. Only Warrior Cats podcast, and fire alone can save our clan. Or can it? <gasps> dun, dun, dun. <laughs>